Here. My name is Lorna Matern. I'm the moderator for this afternoon. I'm also the uh, executive director of United Counseling Service, but that's not why I'm here today. Um, I'd like to thank first our sponsors for this series, which is the Hagman Family Foundation. Thank you for their generosity. Uh, we bring this topic to you today uh, because we know that opioid use has deep, deep roots in Vermont's history and is at epidemic proportions today. Nationally, more than 100,000 people have died from a drug overdose between April 2020 and April 2021. 210 Vermonters have died from a drug opioid overdose in 2021, which was a 33% increase from 2020. Fentanyl overdoses were involved in 93% of opioid-related deaths this last year, and heroin-only overdoses involved 10% of fatal overdoses, which is down from 25% from the previous year. And so even in that very, very brief history in Vermont, a couple of years, the opioids and substances have modified and shifted as people needed them to modify and shift. And so we'll learn more from our wonderful panel about um, history and um, uh, recovery and various other things around opioids, art and recovery. And so I'm very pleased to welcome and uh, introduce our panel. We will present a brief history of opioid use in Vermont, which is really fascinating. Share a personal story of recovery and present thoughts and ideas of establishing change that contribute to turning the tide of the epidemic. It's a big ask. We're going to turn the tide of the epidemic. So first, I'd like to introduce you to Margay Diamond. Margay, originally from Bennington, was named Executive Director of Turning Point Center in Bennington in July of 2022. After graduating from the University of Vermont, she spent 30 years in the San Francisco Bay Area. Over the course of her career, Margay has consulted with a wide variety of nonprofits and NGOs on strategy and development, and also spent 13 years at Charles Schwab leading business development for the National Donor Advised Fund, the Schwab Foundation, charitable fund. She returned to Vermont in 2020 and last year served as co-chair for the town's Community Police Advisory Board Task Force. And Margay is a certified recovery coach and is a passionate advocate for those seeking recovery. Welcome. Thank you. Ray Madison, who was born in Connecticut and grew up in the Midwest, now lives and works in Michigan. Although you're, you're retired. I'm retired. You're retired. He doesn't work anymore. <laughs> As a young man, Ray began using drugs and turning to crime to support his habit, and he was arrested and sent to prison to serve 15 years, where he actually began his career in needlework. Kind of, right? Yeah? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. I, I played on work, so I, I'm taking license here. Uh, Ray has now, now returned, uh, produced several hundred remarkably colorful and detailed threads and fabric images is on the screen there, mm -hmm. each of which tends to be about the size of a standard small index card. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Numerous museums in the United States and overseas have featured his work. His work is displayed at the American Folk Art Museum and the American Visionary Art Museum, to name a few. For his artwork addressing addiction, Ray earned the Innovation Combating Substance Abuse Award from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, mm -hmm which allowed him to create a program teaching art to individuals at risk of developing addiction. Welcome. Thank you. And finally, Ray Shatta. Shatta. Is a New Hampshire native who graduated from the University of Colorado at Vermont Law School and at the American Military University. He served more than three decades in law enforcement as a deputy sheriff in Boulder, Colorado a patrol commander with the Vermont State Police, and as Assistant Attorney General for Prosecuting Vermont Drug Task Force Cases. Gary went on to become an Assistant United States Attorney with the U.S. Department of Justice, where he served as an organized crime prosecutor, as Vermont's anti-terrorism coordinator, and then overseas as a legal advisor to governments in Kosovo and Iraq. Gary has written six books, including an in-depth analysis of Vermont's first opium epidemic in the 19th century, entitled Green Mountain Opium Eaters, A History of Early Addiction in Vermont. Welcome to all of you. Thank you for coming. Uh, and just a few housekeeping details. Um, we want to please refrain from interrupting. 
Uh, not every panelist is going to answer every question, nor are they required to do so. And we welcome any questions from the audience after the panel discussion. So I figured we'd start out with the, maybe the most obvious question is, what drew you to this area of interest? Uh, Margie, why don't we start with you? Sure. Well, uh, I think the first thing is that <clears throat> having been born and raised here in this town, and calling it always home, even when I was living 3,000 miles away, this was always home. Uh, when I returned here, uh, right at the start of COVID, and really understood what had been happening in this town, I was pretty struck by it. Um, I wanted to get involved and I wanted to volunteer, and that's why I showed up at Turning Point. Um, I am a person in recovery, and I wanted to see how I could help. That's really where it all started. And then I met this amazing group of people who celebrate all paths to recovery, who are doing intense peer coaching and helping people to navigate what that path looks like for them. And I was just incredibly inspired. So that's why I'm in this work. Wow, that's quite a story. Um, I was, um, I guess when I got involved in working with substance abusers, uh, because I too, I'm a person in recovery, and you know I went down the whole you know um, difficult path of, of you know using and ultimately um, going to prison for committing some robberies with a toy gun, I mind you. Um, didn't make any difference to the prosecutors, um, <laughs> and um, so I was sent to prison. It was for 15 years, but I was given a parole after seven and a half. And in prison, I learned, I taught myself how to embroider using thread from unraveled socks and um, creating a sewing hoop and tearing a bed sheet, you know, to make pieces of work. And anyway, and it helped me. It, the, the art itself, creating the art, helped me a great deal in my own recovery and I've tried to bring that to other individuals. In fact, there were a couple of guys in the prison that tried to take up embroidery and so I've, I've worked just to uh, create art that addresses substance abuse but also have worked to um, share how it has helped me heal as well. Um, so right now, um, I'm retired. When I worked at uh, Berkshire Farm Center, um, I was in New York. I was given a large grant by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and started a, a, a program to help young men that were identified as having being at risk for substance abuse and giving them art, whatever they needed, whether they were interested in photography or painting um, through because of the grant I was able to get them the supplies that they needed and it's been quite a number of years but a few of them still stay in touch with me so I'm, I'm happy about that and I'm grateful and I'm really honored to be along with uh, Stephen Town. so thank you I hope that answers your question <coughs> uh, I spent plus 30 years investigating drug cases and working with grand juries and going to trials and doing appeals and putting people in jail and sentencing and all that. Oh. And you are an exception from what I'm seeing here in, in the recovery aspect. I, I don't think I've ever seen anyone that recover quite this way and do this kind of ingenious and have a story down um, So having spent all that time in the Life Justice Department um, several years ago, and I was I wanted to get back into history, and so I started writing, doing history and writing books, and I've done several of them. Uh, one of them happened to be the Black Snake Affair, if anyone's familiar with that, up in Burlington, where uh, it happened in 1808 during Jefferson's embargo, and two, two uh, Brooklyn militiamen were killed, and another was injured by smugglers, and they were, both sides were drunk at the time. 
and so I wrote a book on that. And I got interested because I had just come up of my career of dealing with drug abuse at seeing what was going on in 1808 with alcohol and knowing that people have this proclivity to uh, abuse drugs, substance abuse, what exactly was the situation in Vermont in the 19th century. So that caused me to branch off and get away from alcohol and look at drugs. Nobody had ever written about it. Uh, nobody, in fact, had ever written about the health of Vermonters in the 19th century, which really surprised me. And as I worked my way through the century, I found that we had a significant, significant uh, drug epidemic, opium epidemic in 1900. And I'll talk about that later. Anyway, I was involved with that, and I ended up writing uh, pre-mountain opium eaters. And then I got involved in looking at the health of Vermonters, which this just came out from UVM a couple of years ago uh, by the wand of some magician. It's the effects of the railroad coming into Vermont in uh, 1848 and 50, and the significant changes, and the uh, increased instances of abortion, infanticide, uh, the consumption that was killing women. Why were all of these things happening when they did? And tracing it to technology, one was the railroad arriving, and then the second moment of technology that had a significant effect on the drug uh, history of Vermont happened in 1968 when they opened up the interstate, and you could virtually see overnight the significant amount of drugs that arrived down. So that's all described in uh, between these two books here. So that's how I got here. Thank you. While you're talking, Gary, I'm wondering if you could start walking us through history mm -hmm. of um, opiate, opiate uh, abuse in Vermont and the history of it, including what substances contributed to early addiction. Um, was addiction, or when was addiction taken seriously? And who were the main players responding to the reported addiction? I mean, this is a talk for two hours straight, but I'll try and cut this down. Reader. <laughs> Um, it's fascinating how this happened. I went back to the Revolutionary War and was living in drugs. And at the state archives, they have the inventories of things that were shipped from one side of the Green Mountains to the other side as they were doing, take, uh, dealing with battling the British. And you saw numerous times that they were transporting drugs amongst other things. They didn't say what they were, but they were drugs. And then we had this uh, very beginning aspect of the government in the form of the Council of Safety, and they started looking at alcohol abuse that was taking part, or was involved with the troops. And so they started uh, um, regulating, uh, or trying to regulate, the presence of uh, alcohol in Vermont at that time. The war ends, a lot of settlers come in, they plant in, in uh, virgin ground, and we have a ton of uh, wheat that's being produced. You can't transport wheat to Boston easily because of the distance and putting it on a cart. So it gets in, turned into fermented goods or drinks like beer, and then they ferment wine. This is an important distinction in, in the history of substance abuse. There's the fermented goods, and then there's the distilled goods, also called ardent spirits, which you distill out uh, whiskey, rum, that kind of thing. Much more stronger. Um, type of um, substance that everybody was drinking. The thing that's interesting about Vermont, I think, is that we were very minimalist in the extent that we, the legislature and the governor, governors wanted to implement laws. We were very much hands off from that part of making these things illegal. So we had no drug um, laws in Vermont until 1915. We were way behind other states. So we have a century of people struggling with how to deal with these new substances coming in and how the uh, um, government is going to deal with it. So we have minimalist laws, we have a hands-off legislature, the people are left on their own, there's no enforcement, we have no attorney general. We got rid of the AG position in the late 1700s, reinstituted in 1905, one of the few states that had no attorney general to guide how the state was going to take care of enforcement of these things. Andrew Jackson becomes president uh, in, uh, 1820, in the 1820s, the 1830s. And he has a concept called the common man. And it finds a very receptive audience in Vermont. The common man is someone who doesn't need to be told what to do because he's smart enough to uh, take care of his family. He knows what to do. Nobody interferes with his life, and he will not allow people to do that. We had a law in 1820 that allowed for the licensing of doctors 
For the next decade and a half after that, the common man concept jumped in and overtook uh, medicine, if you will. And, they said, and people in general petitioned and they said, we do not want doctor's license. We don't care. We want somebody that we go to that we trust. And that we don't need the government telling us what to do. And then we had the battles going on within the medical profession. The empiricists, which are the botanical, or, or botanical uh, physicians, so-called <coughs> physicians, and the rationalists. These two who were the uh, school, college educated, medical school educated battling at one another. So, in 1838, they succeeded in removing the licensing of doctors. This wasn't going on in other states, it was only going here. So there were no more licensed doctors. There was nobody to enforce doctors doing the right thing. That came in in 1876, when finally they, they put in a licensing requirement, but, as Vermont always very frequently did, they didn't include an enforcement provision. We may make a lot of laws, but we don't have any way to enforce them. So, for virtually the entire 1800s, it's, it's the, uh, the Wild West as far as drugs go. So, as far as what substances are we dealing with, it's important to make this distinction from the temperance point of view. Because the temperance people, which started in 1828, the Vermont Temperance Society, were going after the ardent spirits, the um, the ones that were so disruptive to society. And they, they, people were using opium in a very quiet way, in a gum form. And um, it was very freely available in the stores. Hundreds of pounds of it was available, very cheap. Alcohol was very cheap. And you could go and get that. So you didn't have anybody arguing against either opium, because addiction was beginning to start by the 1840s or against uh, fermented goods like beer and wine. It was all art and spirits for virtually the, all the uh, 1800s. Whiskey, gin, and, uh, yeah, whiskey and gin particularly. Tobacco was also another thing. In 18, uh, 1820, already the Woodstock newspaper was declaring that people that were taking opium, uh, alcohol, uh, opium, art and spirits, and tobacco were feeding their habits. So they already recognized the presence of a habit at that time. Opium was a wonderful drug, a wonderful drug. It allowed the doctors who didn't know about its, its uh, characteristics, they just looked at the outcome. When you feed someone opium, it quiets them down immediately. It's 15% morphine. And you can give it to them raw, you can distill out the morphine, and you can give it to people um, um, orally, by any mucous membrane until 1853 when a Scotsman invented the hypodermic needle, which made it so much easier. And then we had the Civil War, and then we got the increased use of opium so easily delivered by the hypodermic needle. And these needles were available, if you want to show number two, uh, to the public. You could get these things through the physicians or through the general stores. Anyway. I think you can get them through the Sears catalog. <coughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's just an example of, from the uh, Vermont uh, uh, UVM archives. Another important thing to keep in mind is adulteration. Both the drugs and the alcohol was adulterated very heavily, all of these. You did not get pure whiskey or gin. You got adulterated liquid. You didn't get pure drugs. You got something that was adulterated. And people would concoct these snake oil concoctions and it wouldn't have much in it, so you put opium in it you know, to give the, uh, the recipient a kick to convince them that they're getting something so in turn they will come back to you and, and buy. Uh, the, the opium came from uh, Turkey, from Smyrna, and Constantinople, and principally East India is where it was coming from. It was also grown here in Vermont in local gardens. In 1840, 24,000 pounds of it suddenly appeared at the docks. Uh, and I can't tell you what the city it was, Boston or New York, I don't know. That's what got the customs people attention in 1840. 24,000 pounds of this. By 1898, we were importing 565,000 pounds of opium into the U.S. Per capita usage, these are startling facts. In the 1840s, people were using 12 grains. That's roughly two aspirin in a year's time. 
By the 1890s, nationally, it went up to 52 grams, which is about 10 aspirin. In Vermont, it was 2,190 grams, significant uh, increase. In 1842, we had an estimated 200 addicts in Vermont in a population of 292,000. By the 1890s, that had increased to uh, 15,733 addicts here in Vermont. These are all estimates because it's very difficult getting statistics back to back. By 1900, 16% of all physicians in Vermont were addicted. We had 690 physicians, so roughly 110 physicians were addicted to uh, cocaine, or to uh, opium. How seriously was it taken? It was a quiet activity. People did it in the privacy of their homes. They were not out on the streets drinking the ardent spirits and falling in dishes and getting into fights or anything like that. They were mellow. They chilled out is what they were doing with the morphine that was coming from us. In 1822, Thomas De Quincey, a British uh, author and drug user, wrote the famous uh, Confessions of an English Opium Eater, which got a lot of press. And so the public began to learn that there were things that you could do to incorporate this into your life. Who were the main players? The legislature, certainly not. They got actively involved in 1852 with prohibition. Um, by 1894, this, this, I just, it just occurred to me one day, why don't you pull the, the laws from the late 1800s and see how, much, how many laws were devoted to prohibition versus drugs. There were 23 pages covering 111 sections devoted to prohibition. Under the drug section, it was less than one page and had three sections. It's, it's highly indicative of how seriously uh, the government took, took of that. Families took care of the, their poor addicts and their family, if they could. If they couldn't, then it became the town's responsibility to take care of them. If the town couldn't, you petition the probate court, and you get a court order, and you take this act and you put it into the state hospital. Um, could you do number three? This is a, it just a, it was an amazing picture to me that I picked up in um, the Vermont State Archives. It's identified as a morphine opium addict. And if you, it may be hard to see if you're from a distance, but he's got mottled skin and it's blotted and it's, you know, it's not something that you want. This is an addict uh, from around 1900. Um, you know, what happened with may see something even today, uh, people that uh, are severely addicted. The Vermont Temperance Society got involved in 1828, and they weren't going to deal with drugs, as I mentioned. It was not disrupted. The Vermont Medical Society got involved in 1870. Dr. Colton Pettigrew Frost, number four, uh, an extraordinary man, and uh, was heavily involved in a abortion case that I talked about in, uh, in the book or trial he was involved with of a man that was uh, killing a lot of women through abortions. Frost made the statement in 1870 that we can satisfy ourselves by very limited investigation the, the amount of opium prescribed by medical practitioners for the cure of disease, large as its use for this, large as it is for this purpose, constitutes but a small proportion of the amount consumed in the communities in our own state. We know that there are those who will deprive themselves and their families of all but the most absolute necessaries of life and pitch on those to obtain opium, most taken in the form of opium and by mouth. So we know we got a significant problem by the 1870s. Um, and just to show you how practical uh, the problem can be, uh, the next picture is from 1875. This is the Champlain II out uh, on Lake Champlain which plied the trade between the New York and the Burlington, run up on the rocks by a morphine-addicted uh, pilot, destroyed the ship. This is 1875, so it's a practical example of a major cargo. I could stop there, and I mean, there's more to the story, but I don't want to take well, up too much Well, if I can back to that, because it's really fascinating, yeah. um, and, and you can feel your passion about it. Boy, yeah, I mean, it's it. a crazy, crazy century. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and now, Ray, I'm wondering, you, you talk about your um, story around recovery in your book. You mentioned a little bit in your opening. I'm wondering if you could be willing to tell your story. 
Oh, well, as I explained um, in my introductory remarks, um, I, I, you know, I became, I was, uh, grew, grew up as, you know, start my adulthood basically, started in the 70s when I, when I you know, and everybody smoked pot, you know, I mean, you know, and it seemed, you know, it was just acceptable, you know, among our peers. But then in, in the middle 70s, I got introduced to cocaine. And I got introduced to that um, via <coughs> hypodermic syringe. And it just knocked me on my keister. And I, I, I became an addict literally overnight. And, you know, it messed up my career in school. And I finally finished up, but a, a year later than I would have. And then it, it stayed with me for, you know, for the rest of my life. And at that time, and um, I got introduced to heroin, which is, um, you know, of course, an opiate derivative. And in the late seventies, and I loved it too. I mean, people don't use substances because they make them feel bad. I mean, as you, as you said there, it's, you know. I mean, you know, you take a pill, you take you take an injection, and you feel good. Um, so, you, but you feel good until you start feeling really bad, and it's not no longer, you know, you're not taking it anymore because you feel good. You're taking it because you need it, and that's the point that I got to in the um, 1980s, and. Ultimately, you know, my partner at the time and I shopped at Toy Gun and went Kmart, went into uh, parking lots and helped people up and took the money they had. And, but I was, you know, I was not a very clever criminal and I was, um, I was caught quite, quite quickly. And I couldn't believe that I was, you know, I mean, I was going to prison. I mean, you know, I was college educated. Guy. I was, you know, um, white, middle class, and all of a sudden I'm thrown into prison with people that, you know, I don't know anything about this lifestyle. And had it not been for the fact that I got interested in doing something positive, which was the embroidery. I never would have made it through because I, you know, I, I was making pieces of artwork for fellow inmates. Um, you know, they want, you know, like my, the first thing I did was like I did a set of Puerto Rican flags for one of the gangs, and then I did, you know, a number of other pieces, and it earned me respect of all things. And getting respect in prison is like really, really important. And, you know, of all things, I was respected because I was an embroiderer. I mean, I got teased by, you know, by other inmates, you know, and hey, Betsy Ross, what are you doing today? <laughs> and um, things of that, you know, of that nature. But, um, but I found that it, it made me grow as an individual, um, spiritually, emotionally. Um, one guy came up to me one time and he asked, me if I would um, do a piece of work for him and embroidery for him, and he paid me with a couple of joint bones, they call them, in, in the, the big house. And um, so I thought, yeah, sure, I'll do that. So I was doing my stitchery, and I had these, and these I, I stuck these uh, bones in the, um, the, the back of a book and they were calling to me and I said, ah, this would be great. I can get high, I can do my art and, and so I, I lit one up and just a skin little thing and blowing the smoke up to the vents in the cell and you know I, I hadn't done any drugs in a while at the time and I, I got you know just intensely high. I uh, made good drugs in prison, I'm telling you. And, um, and 
and I got up and so I, 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 I flushed you know, the tiny little bit of uh, stub, the, uh, the roach, you know, down my toilet and squirted some uh, baby powder in the air to uh, get rid of any residual odor and went hop back up on my bunk, my perch, and I was giggling and laughing and, and I realized I couldn't do the artwork. Because uh, I was, yeah, I was, I was like, I was stoned. And I didn't, I didn't want it. And it was at that moment that I realized, well, you can have one thing or you can have the other. And I chose the other, which was the artwork. And that's the message that I try to bring to people, is that I think that we're all born with this innate desire to create, to do, to build. You know, if you want to you call in a higher power, you would, you would say, well, God was a great creator, and so we're God's children, then we too are called to create. But if we don't have, if we're not nurtured, if we're not encouraged, that, that uh, whole desire to be creative, to do things in a positive way, <coughs> turns to destruction, self-destruction. Um, you know, sometimes it's vandalism or, you know, just uh, can crime. But it's also self-destruction, which is where the addiction comes in, in my opinion. And because... Drugs destroy people, and they came very, very close to destroying me because there's, you know, getting high, like the closer you come to death, the better the buzz almost. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've gone through convulsions and um, all that and been sick, um, but there was nothing that would stop me from getting high anyway. Mm -hmm. So, I believe that people in general need to be encouraged to create, to do what they want to do. It doesn't have to be embroidery or painting or anything like that. Maybe it's fixing a car, maybe it's doing something, but, but to do, to do positive things. I'm sure you can bear me out with that. So um, anyway, that's, I don't know if I answered the question, I just read a lot. You did, thank you for sharing. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Margaret. What are some of the misconceptions about recovery? Or examples of unhelpful or misleading advice that might come from treatment centers, counselors, or recovery community? Mm. That's a good question. I think one of the most common misperceptions is that people are making a choice to have substance use disorder and that they can stop anytime they want, and that somehow it's a moral failing. I don't agree with any of that, and it's not what I see. Um, I think there's a lot of trauma involved at the root of addiction, and we have tried to move our language very carefully away from junkie to addict to substance use disorder, and very carefully in the fact that we are now recognizing that there are very real mental and biological things at play here um, that have nothing to do with someone's moral failing, whether they're a good person or not. And so by better understanding what happens to the brain and the body when these substances are introduced, especially repeatedly and over a period of time, brain chemistry changes. You know, just like when you go, you and your buddies are at the bar, and you have a couple beers, and that guy has one more, and you say, hey, why don't I take your keys, and I'll drive us home. What are you saying? You're saying you think that person's judgment has been impacted, that they're not fit to drive the car, right? Mm -hmm. So we know from brain imaging, we know from all the studies that have been done, that the executive functioning part of your brain goes offline when you are taking heavy amounts of substances, when you've had too much to drink, right? Your judgment goes. That's 
all the stuff up here, like should I, shouldn't I, I'm going to weigh my choices, I'm going to figure out like, man, I maybe want to do this, but I know it's not good for me, all of that up here. Now you're functioning just from your primal brain. You need something. And your body becomes physically dependent on these substances, whether it's alcohol or drugs. And there is an urge and a need. Your brain has a beautiful function, that is, it produces endorphins and dopamine and things to make you feel okay and pretty good. When you artificially supply those things into your brain repeatedly, your brain stops making it. Your body doesn't make those chemicals anymore. So not only do you have a physical dependence, but you have things missing in your composition, right? So you take that substance away, why don't you just stop? The person is physically sick and incredibly depressed, like suicidally depressed. They're, they have nothing left. So it is a very, very raw state to be in, and it is very easy for people to try and fail because they're trying, and unless they're getting support, right, and their needs are being met, like, we can give you some medication to help your body calm down. We can help you with some therapy. You can meet a peer coach to talk about what you're going through. Unless those supports are there, it's very difficult for someone to recover by themselves. And that is not a moral failing. One thing I wanted to say that's really beautiful about your story is uh, in Vermont, we have a quite a clear set of clear way of thinking about this in that for a long time we thought recovery meant AA. And AA is wonderful. It's also been around a long time and people feel like that's the answer. It's a answer, not the only answer. And so the way we are trained statewide is to recognize and honor all paths to recovery. So artists and finding joy and meaning and purpose in creating something is a beautiful path to recovery. It could include AA or not, right? Uh, I met a gentleman recently who really struck me. He was someone who has come out, he's been in recovery for about 10 years, and he went to a lot of meetings because he was sent there, and they were good. But he was looking for that, what's my purpose? What's the meaning? What, what am I gonna get involved with here in a positive way? And for him, it turned out to be swimming. And he has done these long, long swim tracks now and written, um, I think there's gonna be a film coming out pretty soon called How I Swam My Way Out of a Bottle. And so I mention these things because people's recovery doesn't all look the same. If you think someone's gonna go to a rehab for two weeks, which is what Medicaid allows, two weeks, and come out fixed, it's not happening. That is not enough time. And it doesn't meet all the needs, right? So we have some wonderful providers in town who can help people with physical symptoms that happen in recovery. We have an amazing agency through UCS and we have a lot of beautiful private therapists here who work with people specifically on addiction and recovery and what, what kind of skills you need to learn and the kind of attention you have to pay to this basically every day for the rest of your life. Peer coaching comes in to support people on a one-to-one -one lived experience piece, which can sometimes have a pretty profound impact on reaching people and letting them know that it's possible. This, this road to recovery is very difficult for people. And I see people try and relapse and try and relapse and try and relapse. And sometimes it takes so many times and then they get it. Somehow all this clicks and they find the purpose. And a big part of purpose, for those of you who are familiar with AA, after you go through a lot of steps, there's this part of giving back, right? And I think connecting all the dots 
is what makes this not a simple issue to resolve, right? This isn't a one-stop shop, oh, just do this. It's much more individualized and much more complex than just stop. So I think recognizing how we need to support people in their journey, that recovery is entirely possible, and then when the light goes back on in someone's eyes, you have no idea what kind of an amazing person they could be in our community. May I just um, add on uh, uh, to uh, uh, had, had I not been in prison for seven and a half years, I would not have found or stuck with recovery. Because, I mean, I've worked, I've worked in uh, treatment as well, and, you know, the, the, the two weeks or the 28 days or, you know, just, you know, it might give a person the tools um, to, to perhaps start something, but you can't, but you, you, getting away from that whole physical and mental thing is next to impossible after 28 days. I think in a small community here, one of the things, one of the challenges we face is that we kind of all know each other at some level, and when someone starts to go down this path, <coughs> and what then happens is pretty predictable, right? So just like you shared, you end the crime and the violence that we're seeing is a lot related to people just trying to have enough money to get what they need from a substance perspective. It's just a you know a loop, um, and. No, I forgot what I was going to say. You triggered me to say something, and now I just <laughs> whoop, went right out my head. Well, let me jump in and ask a question about stigma. Yes. Um, you know, you both have um, said it. Um, what am I doing wrong here? Um, about stigma, you talked about that people see it as a moral failing, um, that people feel like, you know, you just have to pull your up from your bootstraps, you have to try harder. Uh, you have insurance companies that say you should be able to get well in 28 days, and if you don't and you're repeating um, relapse, that that um, contributes. And, and I wonder actually about history and how history and some of the legislation that was created after that um, opium crisis contributes to, to stigma. So I'm wondering if you can all find a question, find an answer out of that around stigma and how what you're talking about contributes. If I can just jump in here. Sure. I, um, a lot of what you said, a lot of what both of you have said, has got me thinking a lot. And um, Dina, if you would go on to the pieces that I have there um, called uh, racial, um, healing racial relations, or something of that nature. These are pieces that I did for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, and here we have, um, I did this, this is a, a woman who is calling someone to help her husband get a fix. And here, and he's there in the background, you know, shooting his, his dope. And who is she calling? Calling my main man there, and to get to get the husband hooked up, so we're healing racial relationships in this way. And then there's the next, the other piece got coke. And so this this kind of goes along with um, what you were saying about how it's not just you know it's not bums and you know I mean. It's everybody. You know, it can be anybody. Here's our, our businessman who, you know, well dressed, got money, got the Mercedes, and he's a junk, right? He's not a junk, he's a, a person with substance use disorder. Yeah, he's a junk. <laughs> well, at least we have these these types of outlets for people today in the 21st, 20th and 21st century to, uh, to deal with these. AA-like kinds of meetings. But 
But if you look back to what was happening in the 1800s in Vermont, it was prehistoric. Mm -hmm. What these poor people oh, sure. were going through. This talk, as far as, far as the stigma part of that goes, people that were uh, hooked on ardent spirits, the uh, distilled spirits, and causing such problems, uh, towns were resorting to going to the bars and posting the names of the people, uh, assigning them a stigma that these are not good people to have around. But I mentioned that the, as the transition was going um, to uh, opium. By the way, they had a saying that men drink wine and women use opium. And also, where is it coming from? A lot of these problems were dealt to the public by the medical profession who were dishing out these drugs like crazy and not realizing what the what the effect they were having on them. And it was fascinating to read uh, some of the medical instructions to students that um, in Dartmouth in the 1890s where they were saying, um, don't deal with an addict, just send them to the asylum. Don't get involved with giving them a hypodermic needle. Stick them yourself. It does them good to have to pay you for it. The doctors in Burlington come, that were teaching these students, saying that one of the most problematic things they had in, in teaching them about drugs was to get them interested in knowing that people got addicted and you've got to stop contributing to that, being aware of what the outcome is. But this goes on. This doctor-sponsored abuse happened throughout the 1800s and it happened throughout the 1900s. And if you get to go to the state archives and you pull uh, 1970 uh, drug uh, committee meetings that were being held in Vermont, remember I said that uh, the interstate opened up in 18, uh, 1968. Immediately, um, we had a drug problem. All kinds of drugs were coming in. Nobody wanted to deal with it. The edu education department opted out. They said, we are not going to get involved until somebody tells us we have to. Mm -hmm. They had adamantly had nothing to do with it. Surprisingly, the Department of Health, this is 1970, said we want nothing to do with it until we get a mandate from the governor or from the legislature to do it. But as an agency, they were not going to do it. It was a, it was a hold back to what we saw happening in the 1800s. There's an interesting letter from June Jeffords when he was the Attorney General writing to a Governor Dean Davis saying, I don't know what to do. We have to do something. We've got so much drugs coming in. And education refuses, health department refuses, and right now the only people that are paying any attention to it, aside from the state police, is a committee for youth within the governor's office. That was the extent of it in 1970. But then, you know, everything went downhill afterwards with the crack epidemic, and then which then descended into the big, big pharma problem. So these are these are problems that um, don't relate directly to what happened in the 1800s. But there were also argument, um, letters from people in the pharmaceutical trade to state government saying, you've got to do something about these physicians. We train our pharmacists what it is to do and, and be on the lookout for addiction. But you've got to teach these doctors because they were circumventing the, the laws and writing prescriptions in weird ways that allowed people to have access to many drugs. And we all know from what we've been reading in the last 10 years, Doctors were doing essentially the same thing, being pushed by big pharma to write these prescriptions, uh, you know, 90 days worth of opiates for a, you know, a very minor surgery. Was, you don't see that today, anyway. Margaret, is there anything you want to add on the stigma? Only that my prior thought that left me was that in a small town, and we have quite a uh, keen news coverage of what happens here every day and we see people's pictures and their children's pictures. Um, it's really a question back to all of you, which is how do we let people move on? Do we let people recover? Thank you. And jumping off of that, what can what do you suggest that workplaces, schools, and other social environments can do to be a recovery-friendly environment? <clears throat> we have some examples around, not enough, um, of recovery-friendly workplaces. And the best models that I've seen are some companies very quietly are doing this. 
um, where they are in their new employee orientation, quite candidly talking about recovery and that we hire people in recovery and we want you to know that if something's going on for you and you need to go to a meeting or a doctor's appointment or let's say you need to leave work for treatment, you can go no questions asked and we are not going to fire you. Now, if you fall down on the job and you didn't come to us first, that's a different story, right? But they're encouraging their employees to come ask for the time off that they need to maintain uh, their recovery. And I think that's tremendous. Some employers on a big scale have traveling nurses that you'll see. Um, some of the construction and manufacturing companies that we have here, um, they're keeping Narcan on site. And as some of you know, Narcan is, it literally looks like when you have allergies and you get a nose spray at CVS and you just take a squirt in your nostril and clears it up. That's what it looks like. It's not scary and it's not a controlled substance, but it does reverse the effects of opioids. Doesn't do anything for drinking, doesn't do anything if you're on a Xanax bender, but if it's opioids, which the majority of the overdoses are, right, either a substance laced with fentanyl or something in that mix, um, a dose of Narcan, sometimes two if you really need it, can revive someone immediately and then they can get medical attention. So having companies being willing, even the gas stations around town, we go around to the gas stations and make sure that they have Narcan there in case someone goes down. They can at least do that and call 911. We can't help people if they're dead. And it's not acceptable to think that all addicts should die because I read that on Facebook and it makes me furious. These are people who need help. So. Can you speak to how the COVID-19 pandemic has contributed to substance use? Um, what you've learned about that? And um, Gary, I'd be interested to find out from you if or how the 1918 uh, influenza pandemic may have influenced substances uh, from that point too. I have not studied that. I couldn't answer. Well, I can tell you what happened with was going on with drug enforcement at that time. But, um, actually, I'd be interested. Um, so if yeah. we could hear from, and then Gary, if you could actually talk mm -hmm. about that. Who's asking? Oh. oh, so either one of you or both of you in, in talking about how um, the pandemic has affected <coughs> substance use and your response and what you've learned. I think we would all agree that the quarantine and isolation was rough on everyone, mentally, not having the connection to family and friends and being able to see people it was lonely and scary. Um, and when people are lonely and scared, they tend to bond with something. If you can't bond with someone, you tend to bond with something. And when your present situation is unbearable, it's very tempting to check out. I hear this all the time from our clients, and they say, I just wanted to check out. I just needed a break. Something in their life is unbearable. Maybe it's many things. <clears throat> Certainly when people are homeless, that's pretty unbearable. Um, with the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw people isolated, not going to meetings or groups, relapsing. Uh, we saw other people pushed into mental crisis and self-medicating themselves through a substance or drink. And I think it was very hard for people to get to treatment, get to someone who they can talk to. And so coming out of that, I mean, I think there's a real increased focus on meeting people where they're at, like going into the homeless shelter, going into the paved shelter, going into the schools and meeting people there. But that face-to-face -face human connection is a really big piece to recovery. Here, do you want to talk a little bit about kind of what was Well, I can't make a connection to, to a pandemic of what happened in 1918, but these people, 
that have taken the drugs, like I was saying, it was done silently, it was done in the home, and you didn't tell the people about it, and they withdrew, and they were kind of a self-imposed isolation that was going on. And the only people that the women could talk to would be the physicians. You know, the husband's gone, but the doctors would be there, and they would be prescribing them the drugs. They also had access to, uh, if they could get a runner to go to the local apothecary and pick up drugs for them and bring them back. So there would be self-imposed um, situations. By 1900, there were so many suicides taking place here in London. Opium was being used to um, quiet babies um, and not just to calm them down so they could go to sleep, but they were literally killing babies and killing uh, the infirm and the elderly on these rural Vermont farms. And it was noted when um, statistics on marriages, births, and deaths started in 1857 here in Vermont. And it was a constant uh, complaint by the officials that we don't know fully what's going on in these farmhouses because there was so much that was being done quietly. People were dying, um, like they were, whether it's children or <coughs> mentally ill. Uh, they were being murdered is what they were, were getting by receiving this opium. So, if we could just show um, two things I just want to touch on, number six and seven images. Um, to their credit, um, because of the uh, legislature was not doing anything, the women's, women's temperance um, movement pushed this. And this is the very first book, you'll see it was done here in Vermont. The very first book, Lessons on the Human Body, having to do with uh, physiology, hygiene, and narcotics. This came out in uh, 1894, I believe. So the women were doing this to educate the public. I mean, they, and these are teachers, mainly in Burlington, that were holding contests to have students write essays on <coughs> drugs in the 1890s. Um, but then we lost that in the next several years because, like I said, by 1970, the education department wanted nothing to do with it. The next one has to do with addicts. Uh, this is uh, about 1894. There, there was a whole addiction industry that opened up right around this time. This is the Keeley Institute out of Indiana. But this is the franchise that opened up in Montpelier. This is the uh, Mutual Fire Insurance Company. This is a reunion. It was only open for a few years, and they got together yearly and they'd have a parade. But I mean, these are all addicts that came in to get treated with injections of what they call the double chloride of gold. I mean, it was a made-up concoction. These people paid all kinds of money to go in, and they would live in dormitory situations, and then at certain times during the day, they'd come in and they'd inject them with hydrodermic needle and these bogus things. But these people, even the psychological, they thought they were recovering. But, um, they really weren't. Um, in the 1906, the national government got involved and they created the uh, Pure Food and Drug Act, which required com uh, the contents of patent medicines to be disclosed. Uh, Vermont Congressman uh, David Foster, number 10, uh, he was a former Burling, um, yeah, Foster was a former uh, Chittenden County State's Attorney. Uh, went on to become a representative down in Washington. He introduced the first drug legislation in the country, right. which is the Harrison Narcotics Drug Act. And so Vermont was very much um, slow to get with the program. And in 1915, finally, they created the first law that they uh, drug dealing illegal. And they, they allowed uh, police to go into the pharmacies to examine their records to see who was buying what drugs. So it's the stigma, it's the isolation, people being forced in wars, which you saw resulting in so many suicides. And there are, there are so many stories of people going into these drugstores, ordering a laudanum or what have you, and before they even leave the counter after purchasing, they rip the top up and they are dying this stuff immediately. Laudanum is uh, alcohol and uh, opium, give them a wicked hit. So. People were dying on the streets in Barrie. I mean, there's all kinds of crazy stories. And um, that's where it was. And then finally, we evolved to uh, the AA model, which we've been talking about. And other recovery models, 
you want to talk a little bit about harm reduction in Mark Day and Mark Day? If, uh, you can talk just a little bit about that. Yeah, so we all want people to recover, um, but they're going to recover when they're ready. And it's hard to it's hard to describe what that is, but you mentioned that if you hadn't gone to prison, you might not have stopped. Right? right? Sometimes, a lot of times, people have to get backed into a corner. The drive, the psychological and physical drive of addiction is so strong. And again, that your, all your normal, rational thinking is offline and not available to you. That it really takes something extremely serious to finally shake someone into, oh, I can see now that everything is starting to fall down around me. And whatever that crisis point is for someone, and they say, now I'm ready, we need to be ready to catch that person when they're ready. If they're not ready, sometimes we have a lot of people coming in and they'll say, I need to stop, I need to do this, but they're not quite ready to change, give it up or change their pattern yet. They're just they're making their first exploratory attempts to figure out what this might look like for me or if I think I can do it. So the peer-to-peer -peer support is a really big piece of, yes, you can do this. Um, the other piece is harm reduction, as Lorna just said, which is until someone gets to the place where they really can stop and go to treatment or go, to, go wherever they need to go, what do we do in the meantime so that they don't die? So we talk very frankly with people about whatever their substance is and how not to use alone. I think there's a poster somewhere um, that says 100% <clears throat> of heroin users report that they use with a friend. 80% of heroin overdoses are found alone. What happened? So I think we don't understand our Good Samaritan law well enough here, which is you can call 911 for your friend and you're not going to get arrested, right? But people run because they're afraid. But if what we try to get them to do is don't use alone because you can use, wait five minutes, and then the other person can go. If what you thought you bought was heroin, you don't even know what's in there. And we just because things are so contaminated now, you could think you're, oh, I'm just going to do some lines of cocaine this Saturday night with my friend. It's going to be fun. But in fact, that bag is laced with fentanyl, a deadly dose of fentanyl. And all of a sudden, both people who thought they were going to have, you know, are now dead from an overdose. So we really try to counsel people quite practically on steps to take using clean needles to avoid the spread of hep C and HIV, um, not using alone, testing your drug supply. We actually do have strips that we give out to people in addition to the Narcan, which is a reversal. They have strips they can slide into whatever it is they're using that will show them if there's fentanyl in it. And so they know either to proceed with caution or abandon ship, right? So we want people to be as smart as they can while they're using, and still keep coming to us and knowing what the resources are and next steps. And when they hit that moment that they're ready, then we can move them into treatment. But I think harm reduction is just key, right? It's like what I was saying about putting the Narcan in gas stations and, and companies and on the you know manufacturing floor. Just let's let's try to make be safe until we can get people well. I'm impressed with how much you know things have moved up because you know I I I, um, I worked in substance abuse counseling up to like ten years ago mm -hmm. and what you're talking about wasn't happening and you know, it was just ten years ago. I wonder if this um, question would be for all of you is how that you've used your either knowledge firsthand recovery or
ethics and your understanding of history to help or support uh, those in addiction. I think the history piece is really interesting. Yeah, personally, what am I doing? Well, per personally or professionally, what, what, how has your work contributed to understanding addiction or, on, or helping others in addiction? I'm not a clinician, and I think the most biggest contribution I can make is to find these little known facts mm -hmm. and relate them to the public and see that there are there is continuity. We saw the man there, the half-naked man. I mean, he could be someone sitting in this audience. Uh, the adulteration of drugs that was so prevalent back then is now adulteration of fentanyl today. Uh, the doctor-sponsored stuff that happened about 150 years ago happened in today. Um, There's a lot of continuity. I mean, like, as they say, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes a lot. Mm -hmm. That's right. I personally, uh, <clears throat> I've been in contact, you know, I've used the arts to reach people, and people have reached out to me after seeing a particular art image and asked <coughs> me, you know, what can I do to help them or how, you know, can they, you know, um, you know, they're, they're interested in art. Um, and all I can do is really encourage people at this point. Um, and I, I and I do that. I, you know, um, if, if asked or given the opportunity, and I think that's all. That's probably the most that we can do. Any of us is to, if someone comes to you and says they have a problem, you know, encourage them. If you can't help them, if you don't have the answer specifically, you know, call. I know there are lines to call and and, and so forth. Um, but if someone has a, has a, has a problem, um, help them, you know. I know there's this whole thing about, well, I don't want to get involved, but um, if you just give a phone number to them sometimes, it can be helpful. Mm -hmm. And I think all of this education and understanding about the history of where Vermont has been and where we are today, um, should hopefully create a sense of compassion um, for the people that you see around and the friends and family that you know who may be struggling. Um, it's going to take a village to solve this problem, right? And that means all of us together, lifting people up. Um, the more we stigmatize, the more we say, stay over there, the worse it's going to get. We cannot continue to do the same thing and expect a different result. So we've already, all of us, identified isolation as a big piece of what has driven the intense increase. Um, so for me, um, the power of lived experience, the ability to connect with any kind of person, um, you know, we certainly see a lot of people who don't have a lot left now. They're homeless. Um, they, their family and friends have turned them out. They don't have an ability to, to hold down a job. They're sick. And that is some people. Those are the ones you see out and about sometimes. But there are plenty of people suffering silently, I can assure you. Plenty of people who are terrified that if someone knows, they're going to lose their career job. Um, so we have people from all spectrums that are suffering. It's just the most visible of which are the ones who have really lost everything. And again, if we continue to uh, stigmatize them, to call them as acts and junkies and worthless, they will never get better. So I think the best thing we can do is to connect with people and to model recovery and to model what we want our community to look like and encourage people to participate when they're ready that we want them there. You mentioned um, it takes a village. I just told myself from a law enforcement perspective. Mm -hmm. Support the police. Support the police. And they are not in Vermont. To my experience dealing with them, they're not racist. They're stuck in the middle of 
a very difficult situation, trying to do the best they can with the laws and the procedures there and the resources that they're given. I mean, it's, it's just so disheartening to see there was a shooting here and then and recently. There's been a series of them up in Burlington. These are extraordinary things. It, it just it doesn't like plateau, it just gets worse. And I think, yeah, I mean, you can't, I mean, police departments are having a hell of a time getting uh, officers to join up. They want to take away uh, immunity from them. It's, it's just a mind to be a cop nowadays. So I think as part of this, um, helping the, the addicts and removing the stigma, if you will, I think it's a big part of this that the community needs to say no to these wolves in sheep clothing that are coming from elsewhere to apply the trade. Well, and I, I wonder, because you talked about isolation being a contributing factor, um, but you, you're touching on something, Gary, around uh, geography. And I'm wondering how Vermont's geography... Well, that's, that's interesting, yeah. I mean, one of the things that I think I identified here was the, uh, the, uh, the geographic, geographical situation of Vermont. It was the 14th state in 1790, or 1791. It wasn't part of the 13 colonies, and I think the people there kind of were upset that they weren't part of, of that, you know, the original 13. But Vermonters called themselves the Switzerland of America. You're landlocked. You don't have access to, uh, to water. The 13 colonies were all up and down the Atlantic seaboard. Uh, the only thing that Vermont had access to was to go down the Richelieu to uh, the St. Lawrence. Um, so you had the seclusion factor going on. And you had, as I mentioned, Andrew Jackson telling these people to stand up for your, your independent rights and turn away government and do what it is you think is the thing is going to make your life better. I think those uh, kind of polluted the, uh, the mindset of Vermonters back at that time. Uh, they, they just felt removed and not a part of the mainstream. But that's, that changed overnight when the railroad came in in 1848, 1850, literally. It's trains arrive, and all of a sudden, all the drugs that are being dished out in the, from the back of the general stores, they're moved to the front. They put down uh, marble flooring. They put down marble counters. They bring in glass. They put all kinds of colorful confections and what have you. They make the stores very bright. They put up banners and all that. This happened like bingo. So you bring the train in, and you get people coming up from Boston. Um, so that had a big effect, and then, like I was mentioning, the interstate, the state police crime statistics went from nothing from drugs to just skyrocketed in, in the next couple of years. To support the police, I guess that's that's the point I want to make because I think they've been vilified way too much, not just in Vermont but you know, nationally. Not that some of it doesn't deserve, because police can do some stupid things, and the police will admit that. But uh, by and large. You've got a drug problem here, and, and uh, it breaks my heart to see what the Bennington police and Burlington police and the state police are all going through, because these are hard-working men and women. We work very closely with the Bennington Police Department, and I know how much pressure they're under, and I know that they're trying to do a good job. Um, we have a program that we run, and it's been running the last couple of years. It's called an opioid response program. And that is where if a call comes into dispatch that reports an overdose at someone's house or at subway or wherever it is, dispatch pages us. And we have trained peer counselors who are available 24-7 to go to the scene to try to talk to that person if they can. Um, and even, even as important as the friends, family, bystanders and making sure all those people understand what the risks are, that they have harm reduction um, supplies on hand, and that they know that we're here when they're ready. What else, um, maybe Margaret and Gary, uh, has Vermont done well, either legislatively, legally, uh, response to the opioid crisis? How well is Vermont doing? I think philosophically, we're way ahead. This model that we're operating under now, which is that we value all paths to recovery and that there are as many paths to recovery as there are people, 
and the AA is not always going to be the right fit for someone, so there are other ways to look at it. Um, the training that we receive, which is fundamentally based in motivational interviewing, which says you're in charge of you and I respect that. I am here to listen deeply and offer guidance and resources from my own lived experience, but I am not deciding what to do for you. You're deciding. And when we put someone's recovery plan back in their lap and let them own it and create it, then it works. And I just think it's tremendous. Other states are not doing this with as much passion and uniformity as Vermont is right now. <laughs> and Gary, I don't know if you speak to. Yeah, I mean, she's in the trenches and dealing with this and much more close to the problem than I am. So, thank you. <laughs> well, the, the last agency that I worked with in, in Michigan, they had a, uh, a program, there were like six or eight different ads that, you know, that people could choose. Nice. You know, they were just straight AA or they were um, uh, Native American meditations nice. and, and meetings. Um, and that, that was, you know, I thought that was very progressive. Um, but there are some, you know, what you said really hit the nail on the head was people have to be ready, you know. I mean, people send people to treatment and they do interventions, they call them, and, you know, because you need help. And, um, but if they're not ready to stop, they're not going to. I mean, I, I worked with, you know, a few different um, young men that, you know, that I really truly liked and, and wanted to help them uh, move forward and, you know, and they would spend, and this one, the one thing, the other thing about this program is it wasn't just the 28 days, they would stay as long as they needed to stay. And, you know, which it can be, you know, uh, financially prohibitive in a lot of cases. Um, but, um, and then I, 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 I go to the, you know, the ceremony that they would have as a person, um, finished their treatment and were going to be going home or and we had set up for them um, what their living circumstances would be, in some cases group home recovery houses. And um, and then only to hear, you know, a month or two months later that oh so and so OD. Because one of the things that happens too is person that uh, obsessively uses drugs is they can use higher and higher and higher doses to get where they want to be. And then if they if they stop using um, and it's you know several months, then they go back to what they were what taking. Last dose yeah, whatever the last dose was and you know and it's, too it's all over. Mm -hmm. But um, there was another thing I wanted to say too, um, and I don't know how this might apply, but the whole 28-day treatment thing was started through the insurance companies. And, um, and the insurance companies lobbied heavily to get um, addiction labeled as a sickness, as a disease. Because then, um, once, the, you know, once it was a disease, then insurance could pay for it. And, so they, you know, that was that was part of the equation back in the, uh, I think, uh, early 70s, maybe late 60s. So, for what it's worth. Mm, thank you. What do you think, and this goes to all of you, is the most powerful tool that we can use in combating the drug issue? Just so you know. <laughs> was that the... Nancy Ray. Nancy, Nancy Ray. Yeah. Nancy Ray. No, I, I very much liked um, what Mark Gay had said about um, about compassion, and you know, just we need to care, mm -hmm. and 
it, you know, and it starts with that, with a, com a community that cares, is, is a very important thing. Um, and treatment that goes beyond just, you know, you know, a week in the dry out clinic and then, you know, back on the street to the AA meetings, um, because you know, AA isn't everybody's answer. So, but yeah, I like a lot of what you said. I think we're getting to a place where we are increasingly more comfortable talking about mental health as a very real thing. And as I mentioned earlier, we see a number of clients who are self-medicating. They need help. They do need help. Whether it's from a trauma that they're unable to process, um, you know, brain chemistry issues, whatever the situation is, they don't feel right. And they tell us that when they do whatever it is, like they shoot up with heroin, they feel like they feel normal. I hear that a lot. So they're not even saying, I was so high. They're saying, I felt normal when I did this. So for those people, um, we really want to be talking about mental health and getting them connected to the kinds of services that are going to get that person better. Um, but to ignore mental health and pull yourself up by your bootstraps, uh, that is not going to shift anything. So I think we're doing a much better job of recognizing these things, of incorporating a model of treatment that addresses people's basic human needs. It's pretty hard to get someone to go through this journey of recovery and the pain and suffering that goes along with it, very real, if they're homeless. And we know we have a housing issue here, right? So basic human needs need to be met in order for someone to be stable enough to do this work and get themselves in recovery. Um, and so I think we need to be thinking about uh, what the community looks like and how welcoming and supportive we are. I think we need to look at housing and basic needs. I think we look at treatment. There aren't enough treatment facilities. And again, I'm not talking, I would separate out sober living, transitional housing from treatment but two weeks of treatment, not even close. Mm -hmm. And then and then what? We put people right back, we send them right back down here on a bus and just say, here you go. Mm -hmm. This transitional piece is really important for people where they have access to sober living situations. Um, we don't have any of that right now in town, not any of it. So the people we're sending up to Virgins, to Bradford, to Serenity House, or Valley Vista, which are treatment centers, they're coming back two weeks later. Not a lot is changing. Their home environment has not changed. Their friend group hasn't changed. The way people look at them hasn't changed. They still can't get a job. All these things are still the same. We need a landing space for people that allows them to heal. Because I'll tell you, they're not done healing after two weeks. Mm -hmm. And uh, finally, I wanted to um, ask if you could um, identify what the community, um, you, know, you just kind of jumped on a little bit, but I'm sure you have other things to say, Mark A. What um, might the community do to make a difference? And whether that's um, right in your own community or whether it's in um, Bennington County community that could make a difference.
was I put together a, a program and idea and stuff and um, for helping people while they were in prison because um, that's what helped me being there and while you're there you know I mean you know people don't want to people don't want to say yeah they get an education and they get to do this they get to do that and they should do you know but when they get out of prison you know um, generally you've got a worse product um, I, I, I was contacted and I met with uh, a group, um, mainly women in, uh, in Great Britain, and they have a program that's called Find Cell Works. And volunteers go into prisons and they teach men how to embroider. And they, they help them with um, the embroider, they give them the, the supplies they need to embroider on pillows and do these designs and so forth. And then they sell them. They have, they have like um, a, a fair or, of sorts, um, you know, a few times a year. And they sell these pillows and other embroidered items that prison inmates there have made. And they get the and they put the money in the accounts of the inmates. The inmates can't touch it while they're in prison, but when they get out, they have a little nest egg. Um, and you know, and I, and it's been a very successful program for them. It's been you know running for quite a number of years, and it's called Find Sellers. And and I tried to pitch that to um, different uh, states there. Correctional departments and um, and even the uh, federal program and nobody's interested. Uh, nobody was at the time, and uh, I was pretty disheartened. It really spoke to your um, your uh, passion around creation and being able to create and use art for recovery. Yeah. You just made me think of, um, we don't do anything like that here in Bennington yet, <laughs> but the um, Turning Point Center in Rutland uh, works very closely with Marblehead Prison. And I think a lot of us sort of see that as a model that could be replicated because it's been going on about four years now and even through the COVID pandemic. Um, they couldn't see people in the prison, but they wrote letters every month to them and kept in touch. So as soon as they could get back in, um, but uh, I've heard from one of the inmates that had worked with the Scal Tracy and her team, who is of course now out, and he said, when I came into prison, it was the fourth time I had been in there, landed myself in there, and I thought, this has got to be it, man. Like, this is, <laughs> I can't do this again. And he saw a flyer that said, there's going to be a recovery group. And he thought, I don't know what that's all about, but I'll just go. And he said, and I went, and people were talking to me like they respected me. And, and they were asking me how to define myself and what are the things that I hoped for and dreamed for and he said I had only ever identified myself as a felon and an addict and all of a sudden I saw myself as something more and I just personally thought that was incredibly powerful right so when people get out of prison what happens? How do they see themselves? Do they see hope? Do they believe they can be something different? And just the simple way that we talk to people can make such a profound difference. I just to um, follow up on, on that. When I was nearing the end of my incarceration, I would talk. We were we were in a super minimum security situation. The guys were getting close to being out. Um, and I was talking to one of the, one of the guys who was going to be paroled like in, in a couple of weeks, and I said, "So what you going to do when you get out?" You know, and he says to me, "He says, well, he said my brother's got a 
place that I can live for a while. And he said he's also got this like local delivery business that um, he'll give me a job doing. So he said, I'll, you know, he said, I'll do that. He said, but, you know, if that doesn't work out, he said, hell, I can do this, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, you know, mm -hmm. so I had three hots in a cot. Mm -hmm. yeah. So anyway, I just threw that out there. Mm -hmm. To, I guess you're quite a point. Yeah. yeah. Couldn't think of the word. <laughs> well, thank you so much. What about, um, we have time for questions? Anybody or comments? Yeah, we're going to start with Peter in the back. Hey, Gary, um, as a longtime prosecutor, what do you see as the role of a prosecutor in the recovery process for someone who is, has substance abuse issues? I don't recall standing in the way of anybody. I mean, it was not the policy to stand in the way of someone engaging in seeking to get recovery. But I mean, that was kind of secondary, because the number one thing we were doing was getting the person in court and getting their case resolved, dealing with victims and what have you. So their recovery might have taken us a bit of a, uh, you know, was not quite so important as dealing with the major thing that was on the plate. But we always dealt with the probation department, and they were always, um, working to get plans in place for these people. We never stood in the way of that. I mean, it was always a good thing. I know defense attorneys would always stand up and uh, make a big deal of people going into recovery. And I think it's taken me some time to appreciate just exactly what that means. But, uh, you know, more power to them. But we, it's a matter of prioritizing. From a prosecution standpoint, it's a matter of prioritizing what has to be done now. And their recovery is kind of secondary, unfortunately. But if you can fit it in in some way through pretrial services before they go to trial, getting them into recovery uh, situations, by all means, they should be able to do that. Dina? Uh, is the situation in Vermont different than? say, other surrounding states, say New Hampshire, Massachusetts. Um, and if so, it, how does that connect to the, the historical piece? Because, you know, Gary was, was explaining that Vermont was sort of really late to establish some, some laws and regulations. Um, and so I wonder, you know, to some extent, did um, substance use and abuse sort of become a little systemic in Vermont? Um, and maybe, maybe it didn't. Um, so that's sort of part one of my question is, is the situation here different? And if so, how does it tie into the history? Vermont? You know, Vermont, I mean, I remember in, uh, in the 80s when I was prosecuting the drug task force cases, we were dealing with a lot of crack matters. And uh, it was the inner city drug dealers who couldn't make it in the inner city. These were the losers in the city that were coming to Vermont. And they were hooking up with, with the impoverished up here in their apartments. And they would open up drug dealing there. If it wasn't them coming up, and they were coming up, um, using buses, rental cars, train, if it wasn't that, then it was every Friday night, Vermonters were showing up on the streets of Springfield, and they were uh, picking up the drugs down there. So, I mean, I think the drugs were more readily available, obviously, in Boston, New York, Springfield. Springfield was always a hotbed of problems for our, our drug dealing, you know, back then. Um, drugs were in Montreal in the metropolitan areas, but then in, you've got to get them to Vermont. And Vermont has uh, been a corridor, if you will, to get drugs from Montreal to Boston or down to New York. It was always in the middle. So it, it plays a unique situation because of this geography. I think. And I would say, Margay, that you would agree with that currently in present day. Yeah. Okay. 
Gary, I have a question. After the 1920s and before the 1980s, there was institutionalizing of people with recidivist behavior, <coughs> either in the jails or mental institutions. I'm thinking of Brattleboro Retreat. But before that, did they just like, I, I heard a rumor, I don't know if it's true, that before there were institutions, they would use panel as a repository for every problem that they had. They would use what? Hamel, our southern, western, yeah. outer Siberia, they banished people. The, the dog trap. So, uh, yeah, so I'm just sort of wondering, where did we lose sight of the idea that we were actually trying to house these people or put them up uh, rather than throw them to the wolves? I mean, it's, we used to have institutions. But we don't do that. Yeah, I mean, there were not a lot of, one, there were no crimes against drug dealing. So in the 1800s, you didn't, you didn't have people penalizing going to the state prison, okay? So they would end up going to the state hospital, perhaps. But in what I was, I looked at some of the, uh, the uh, inventories of people that were there, their ages, where they came from in the state, why they were there. And by and large, I was really surprised. I expected to see more um, drug and alcohol people in the state hospital, and there were really a, a very small amount. There were actually a lot of the mental types of problems. So, which, you know, caused me to ask the question, well, then what's happening to them? And the families, I think, they end up in, the families are dealing with that. Or they're, you know, cast aside and, you know, they're found in a dish someday. Certainly, the physicians were not getting involved. They, they wiped their hands of the whole thing. And so you were not getting that. And I can't tell you where they were putting them. And maybe in the local lockup. They were doing that an awful lot. Just lots and lots of inebriated uh, Irishmen and women uh, in the Rublin and Burlington the jail and surveys coming in. So, no, there was, no, there was nothing formal. I think getting them into a state institution that was really effective. So the, the public compassion that we're currently experiencing, hopefully, is a relatively new development in the treatment of mental health and uh, substance abuse? I don't profess to know much about mm -hmm. what you're talking about. Yeah. Margaret Ray, do you want to um, uh, speak to that? Whether there's greater compassion for folks with mental health or substance use? More. Not well, enough. That, that, it's the direction that that uh, people want to go. It's like when when Robert Wood Johnson Foundation got behind what I was thinking and doing the artwork and so on. Um, their whole thing was they wanted to put a face on addiction and drug abuse. And it wasn't just um, as uh, Margaret said, you know the the junkies or the skid row bums that were, you know, it was anybody and everybody. And who's affected? Society. <coughs> in, in, in you know, on the whole of society. So I think the fact that, you know, that there's more emphasis on putting a face, if you will, on addiction and mental health um, issues is a really good thing. Mm -hmm. Can we do more? We have to. Um, and I think that there's there's a lot of good things that are going on with law enforcement, and um, you know, so as long as we keep growing in the direction of of helping rather than stigmatizing, um, that's the right thing to do, in my opinion. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I too, like Ray, was uh, pleased to hear compassion being brought in that you also echoed. And, um, there are two programs, one program and one board here in Bennington that are underway. And I would love to have Margaret talk about both the Pathways program and then also CPAR, the Community <laughs> Police Advisory Review Board. We can catch up after. Um, the, I think if what's amazing is that People are saying, I'm in recovery. You know, no one was talking about this 10 years ago, and we were stigmatizing people really hard. 
And the only time you would hear people admit it is when they went to the church basement, right, and were drinking some bad coffee and sat around in a group and said, hi, my name is Mark A, I'm an addict or an alcoholic. We don't ask our clients to say that about themselves at all because we don't want people defined by this. We want to know who you are. That's not who you are, right? Just like the guy in prison, he's not a felon and an addict, he's a person. And so I think when we, as we've shifted and moved into recognizing that this is a disease, it can be overcome, that there are real physical and mental things happening that can be addressed, and that there's a great person underneath there and the more that we have shifted in that direction, the more successful we will become. Um, I think people always ask me, like, how many people recover? And that's a really hard question um, to count numbers because we lose track of people here and there. And uh, I've seen national figures cite anywhere between 50 and 75% recovery rates. But that has everything to do with what that person's recovery capital is. And recovery capital is your supports, right? Do you have stable housing? Do you have someone who loves you and who will be there for you? Do you have a person? Some people have no one, right? They've burned all the bridges or whatever their circumstances were. But having someone is incredibly important. Are they living in a community where they feel supported? Do they have purpose in their life? A job to do, or a volunteer thing, or something where they're engaging and giving back. So all of these components, you know, we assess that when people come in, and we know how much, at, we can tell with a pretty high degree of certainty how likely it is that they're gonna relapse based on an empty circle where all this recovery capital should be, right? Um, did you want me to talk about the different yes, I, don't, I don't know if everybody knows those are two really good things that are are yeah. so the the pathway to pathways to recovery is as broad as you want to make it uh, as mentioned AA and then NA which is narcotics are anonymous have been around for a very long time and they're great and they're still running an all recovery group is a lot of what we talk about with our clients, which is basically the premises of, let's figure out what the triggers are. What's the why behind your use, right? It must do something for you. And I said, mostly the answer comes back, I, I just wanted to disappear. I just needed a break. I just needed to check out. That's always what comes back. So then the answer is the why. What's happening for you? And how do we handle this thing that you're running from or shutting down from? What can we do to make things different? So there's a lot of teaching about new habits. Um, we do a lot with people around wellness, right? What you're eating in your body, how you're feeding your creativity and your social activities and getting engaged with people. Um, one pathway to recovery uh, for folks who are faith-based, uh, there's something called Celebrate Recovery, which is run out of Mission City Church, and that is very scripture-based, um, but follows, again, a very similar path of really assessing things in your life, figuring out what works and doesn't work for you, and then making some pretty significant changes in terms of replacing that I'm gonna go have a drink with, now I'm gonna go on a hike or I'm gonna make a phone call, right? So interrupting these patterns and creating a new strategy for survival moving forward. That is at the core of every path. But there are amazing things out there like Dharma recovery, which is based on Buddhist teachings and is fundamentally um, secured in the practice of meditation. You know, a way to center, a way to calm, without the use of something else. So those are all components of these various different paths that exist. I, I met the one that had a state funding, the, the, the Pathways Program, the housing and support services as well as ah, you need those. Sorry. That's OK. <laughs> but I liked that answer. And I, I'm wondering if you might be able to connect after, because it's a little bit different. And I know that there's the results coming from there. Well, 
it was more of an observation that you know, to get the system to be working effectively that we want, you know, we talked about all these different discrete services and approaches and individual things. But you brought up something I think that I think they should build on. A, a, a small example you mentioned earlier, when you had the companies that were allowing people to go out to work. What that does, it normalizes the recovery process in the community. Right? And therefore, you know, then, by the way, those people work with other people who then see them as examples. That's so right. that is a snowball effect. That's right. And, I, and when you think about it, it's a very simple strategy. It wasn't complicated. What was complicated was probably get to get the employer to, to go along with it. Now that I got, I, you know, I got that. But over time, building on something like that, this is a day and age of unemployment. Every employer is looking for people. If that shows success over years or two, I guarantee you places will start wanting to duplicate something like that. And then it has, again, the additional effect of normalizing recovery in the community, which everybody has to begin to understand that. Uh, you know, that's like a public, the public service announcement has to go out to see it for that. I think it would be a huge benefit for the company. And, I, you know, you named it, and I'm sure you know more than I, I don't know any more than you mentioned. But again, the thing, the example of what's being left at the, the gas stations to normalize those things. That gets advertised and understood over time, and then that just becomes an integrated part of the thing that everybody assumes it's going to be there. So I really think that's a great thing that you got done. Build on something like that. that would be good. Can I just introduce um, Mr. Kevin Walsh, who is the clinical director where I worked at Berkshire Farm Center, and um, who, who um, approved a lot of the things that I was doing there. And some I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to jump up. One, one more thing I just wanted to say. Um, I went to, and this was when I worked here in Vermont, I went to um, a a conference that dealt with um, the, the, the topic of self-harm. And, you know, people that cut themselves, it's, it's a whole different addiction. Um, but we had a, a, a rather prominent psychiatrist who came in and spoke. And he said one of the things that they, um, they do that's really simple, he said, is we try, is when people get into these um, thinking of these loops of, you know, what am I going to do, what am I going to, you know, I'm going to hurt myself, or, you know, I'm going to use, you know, I'm going to use dope. Um, he said, we try to get him to change the channel. Mm -hmm. And um, and he had all of us stand up and sing the Itsy Bitsy Spider song. And um, and I, I, I taught that in my, um, when I was later at a, a different facility, you know, and you know, and it was just the weirdest thing in the world to to, to my director at the time. You know, it was a, I have these clients sitting in this um, group room and singing "It's a Spider," and, um, and and I said, I said, so the next time when you're out there in the world and you know, and you're thinking, I got to use, I, I, you know, I just, I just got to get, you know, change the channel. Anyway, again, great story. Yes, I have a question for Gary. Thinking about, I don't know, as you've been thinking about the history of, of substance abuse and mm -hmm. substances in Vermont. Have you looked into when fentanyl started coming into Vermont and how that may have changed substance abuse and how it changes, in fact, from our day, how that changes dealing with people? Because oftentimes you, somebody may have. Taken something that has fentanyl and had no idea that it did. A lot of times, a lot of times. And, you know, apparently it's being laced into things Every that day. people think are reasonably benign, and all of a sudden they're addicted to fentanyl. It hooked a lot of people in the 1800s that didn't realize that they were taking opium. They thought they were getting, you know, a kick ass version of whiskey or something when it actually was laced with opium. Because there was so much adulteration going on. You, there was no such thing as pure drugs or pure alcohol back then. I think the the stakes get higher. I don't know how to compare it to history, but uh, but I what I think about the epidemic changing here because you know, and I'm sure most of you understand that 
you know, if you've had a hip surgery or something, you've had heroin, by the way, okay? We need these drugs for medical purposes and for surgery and very severe pain. Fentanyl is a synthetic opioid, right? It's been in use and medical use for a long time, but it's cheap to produce, way cheaper than opium or heroin. It is, and it's synthetic. So who knows what the quality control is on the fentanyl out on the street as opposed to what you would get in a hospital situation, right? So you've already got a, a tainted product out there that you know has everything from like lighter fluid to battery acid to anything thrown in there with it. And then they just spray it on everything. Everything is cut with it today. So people who are buying cannabis on the street and not from a dispensary, they think they're just getting weed, and then all of a sudden they're dead. I mean, the stakes are way higher now. Has that actually been demonstrated with cannabis? The cannabis is not the problem. It's the fentanyl. No, but as everybody says here, it's cannabis and it's tainted with fentanyl. Yes. Not, I can't because say all of it, but yes. Testing, uh, I mean, we're not people show up at the hospital the and they're being tested. temperature of cannabis is sufficient to kill the fentanyl. I don't know anybody who sells their customers expensive cannabis laced with fentanyl. I think that's just a tale that people have given to avoid admitting that they used it as though it was on the cannabis and then it became legendary. I haven't seen any proof and I've seen a lot of scientific evidence saying that that's not going to happen. It's a way that dispensaries don't want the local growers to have a market to. Interesting. Uh, well, well, I guess we could debate guys, that one fact. One of the guys but... that's doing a dispensary in Wilmington actually posted that on his Facebook, and I called him to address that you're mm -hmm. tempering your customers to not trust the uh, underground market in lieu of a right. legal Vermont market. I'm just saying. So I, I'm I don't want to let stuff go. Because yeah. we've worked so hard to bring education right. to a level where we're not just propagating lies and in the U.S. So. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. So I guess I am talking generalizations here because I literally see, I see all, I have seen the whole range and um, things being impacted. So again, you know, I was it like a year ago, I read about some West Point graduates who went to Florida on their spring break. Did you guys remember that one? And they were just gonna party it up and they got some Coke and it was laced with fentanyl and they all died. So, this is happening in lots of different places where the drug supply is being cut just for, for profit. That's why it's happening. Then the last question. Yeah, I've always been uh, concerned with the parallel between the prohibition and the laws against drugs, pushing of drugs these days, which I think is quite counterproductive, actually. And I think that there's some countries, maybe in Europe, who are now... Uh, Portugal. Could be because you're giving drugs to people, mm. maybe to, to correct me if I'm wrong, so they don't have to go to pushers mm -hmm. to get their drugs. But again, I think the great profits that are made on drugs is because of laws. And it didn't work in prohibition, it's obviously not working now. And the war on drugs is a disaster, has been a disaster. So I just wonder any thoughts on that. Yes. <laughs> Would you like to share those? Uh, Portugal's the only country, I think, thus far that has decriminalized all drugs. Everything. And they took all the money that they were pouring into arresting people and retrying people and this revolving door, and they put it all into treatment resources. So um, they say, we're not going to put you in jail, but you're going to go to treatment. You're going to have counseling. You're going to have a job, so you have purpose. And they set people up with what I talked about before, which is that recovery capital. That's what they give them now. So they put all the money that they were using for arresting people and back into the recovery of the individual, and it's working. So I can't rattle off the exact stats, but I think they had said that heroin use was down like really by 50%. Uh, HIV was massively down, uh, everything across the board. So it's an interesting model, um, not one that I think the United States has the appetite for right now as a country, 
but we see little microcosms pop up, like Oregon, you know, making attempts to decriminalize. Um, certainly with cannabis being decriminalized at a national level, that's one step. Um, what you're referring to would be more like safe injection sites and or supplying someone with what it is they want. So people could come into centers and actually get heroin if that was their drug of choice. And the thinking would be that it's safe, it's contained, we, and a lot of injection sites say they've never had an overdose, they've never, uh, like three times out of you know, years that they had to call um, medical professionals to come and help. But they can keep people, again, it's harm reduction, right? So all you're doing is, you're not promoting their use, you're saying, you use, we want to help you do it safely until you're ready to stop. And since we're almost out of time, I wanted to end with, if, uh, what is one thing that you want to make sure that the audience takes away with them tonight? Start with anybody who pops in their head first. I, I, I encapsulated it earlier, I just think that uh, some of the problems we're seeing today are not new. Yes. They just were wearing different clothes 150 years ago. Mm -hmm. And it's and what's it going to be like 200 years from now? I mean, it could conceivably be just a continuation. So we're, as much as we like to think we're unique, you know, maybe we're not. I would um, simply like to, you know, reiterate, you know, what I've already said and how I, you know, about, um, you know, make, and this is the kind of thing that's a good thing because, I mean, while we're not loaded with people here in the audience, um, getting out there, you know, getting the message out and getting, you know, and, and trying to destigmatize um, addiction and, and mental health issues is, is a good thing. And the more we can do to promote that kind of um, attitude, the better off we are. Mm -hmm. The better off the community is, the better off the country is. I think it's been fascinating to hear about the history piece of it, because I really didn't know. Um, and yeah, here we are. Um, we've got to start doing things different, right? We just have to do something different, and I think fundamentally, I'm going to go back to that compassion word. It's about really seeing people as people and letting, letting us, as a community, encouraging people to recover and allowing them to recover and walk on with their lives. Um, that's a big one here. So thank you for having us. Thank you um, so much. I've got a lot out of this today. I hope you did. Um, as an employer in the community, I'm going to um, introduce the um, orientation uh, piece with the uh, new staff and, and encouraging them to go and get their needs met. Um, and I appreciate you all being here. Thank you so much for our panelists. It's really been a great conversation and fascinating.